Hi, my name is Jason Solomon, and this is Keeping the Context, a 21st century approach to getting more from your practice. Today, I want to talk specifically about facial stability. So my goal for today is to give you an 18th camel. Now, some of you may look at that and say, hmm, I don't know what that's about. It may seem like a strange statement. So let me explain through a little story here. Once upon a time, there was a man and the man had 17 camels and he had three kids. And when he passed away, he uh, wrote in his will to give his camels uh, to his three children. To his first child, he wanted to give half of his camels. To his second child, he wanted to give one third of his camels. And to his third child, he wanted to give one ninth of his camels. It's kind of an interesting way to write that in your will but that's what he did and the children had no idea what to do because you can't split 17 into any of those numbers right 17 is a prime number it doesn't really work very well so they went to the village elder and the village elder chuckled and said okay um i'm not going to be able to solve your problem for you but i have this extra camel take my extra camel may it help you on your journey and so the kids went back and said okay well now we've got 18 camels and the eldest child said well wait if there are 18 camels half of that would be nine so i'll take nine camels and then the second eldest child said, well, wait, if there are 18 camels, one third of that would be six camels. So I'll take six camels. And then the youngest child said, well, wait a second. If there's 18 camels, one ninth would be two camels. So I'll take two camels. Well, if the eldest takes six and the second eldest takes, uh, or sorry, if the eldest takes nine and the second eldest takes six, and then the third child takes three, that's 17 camels. So they have one camel left over. So they gave it back to the village elder. And the village elder managed to help them with their problems by essentially letting them borrow an 18th camel. So my goal for today, many of you, if you're watching this video, you've already done a ton of work, lots of practice, lots of experience. You bring a lot to the table. My hope is that what I provide today might be that 18th camel that helps kind of lock things into place and makes those breakthroughs happen for you in a way that's meaningful, that helps you on your journey and helps you achieve your goals. Now, the other way to look at this is that when I first said that, if you haven't heard that story, you probably heard me say that and thought, mm, that's strange because you didn't understand the context to which I was speaking. Context is everything. And most of, you know, so much of what we do really, we need to respect the context to which we're working in. And there's many ways that we can look at different contexts towards how we practice, and how we teach and how we play. So here are some concepts to keep in mind. Uh, when I think about the industry that I'm playing in or the group, you know, that I'm kind of working in, I'm a bass trombonist by trade. And so I think about it kind of like a mountain, like there's a, like a mountain bass trombone and there's different levels or bass camps kind of up that mountain. And at the bottom of the mountain, the base of the mountain, you know, you have, let's say everybody who's ever, you know, played a trombone and that might be like a million people. And that might include everybody who's, you know, ever, ever held one. Great. But if we think about the, the top 10% of that group, we'd be thinking about the top hundred thousand. And now we're talking about maybe advanced high school or university trombone students who've kind of made it to that level. Okay, great. Well, they play a certain way, they practice a certain way. And then we think, well, what about the top 10% of that group? And then we get into the top 10,000. And now all of a sudden we're thinking about maybe like those top graduate students and freelancers and people that are getting paid to play their instrument. Well, they practice a certain way. They kind of view it a certain way. They have certain concepts, right? Certain contexts that they respect. And if we think about the top 10% of that group and the top 10% of that group and the top 10% of that group, we can find all these different kind of levels throughout the industry until we get to the top. Now, arguably, the top level, that top 10, that, that, that's going to be somewhat subjective, right? We're all going to have slightly different tastes or biases or whatever. But I think this general concept of, you know, this logarithmic progression within any in industry, for me, it happens to be based trombone, but this can apply to kind of anything. If we kind of reverse engineer how people at that level approach what it is that they do, how they practice, what contexts they respect in their pedagogy, what they prioritize, that can give us some profound information uh, and helpful guidance to get to that level. And so that's why I bring it up. Now, another concept that I think is really important is sometimes we kind of look at success as being kind of on or off. We kind of dichotomize it. And I don't think that's the case. I think that there are many levels of success. So the first level of success that I talk about is uh, survival, right? Barely getting through something, you kind of play it okay. We've all done gigs where we felt like we were surviving, reading duets with somebody, or you know, you get called last minute. And we're basically just trying to do no harm and get through it and, you know, just kind of not light ourselves on fire, right? But as we get to higher levels of achievement, and this can be an exercise or repertoire or whatever, we might reach a level of competence, right? And we all might have a slightly different impression of what that is, but we understand that there's kind of a level of up. And then there, I think there's a next level up from there, and I would call that proficiency. Now, for those of us that have studied in music programs, particularly at the university level, 
uh, there's usually a piano proficiency. And I think that's completely the wrong term for it. I think it's piano survival. And I think we're all kind of just trying to reach a basic level of survival of skill on piano. But we call it proficiency. It is what it is. Um, and I think we can all agree that at the top, you know, there, there's like a level of mastery. Now, any one of these has subtle gradations within, like you can master something more, you know, and you can master something less, you know, there's, there's a lot of different levels within. But I think it's important to think about what level we're talking about. And there are times where this will come in handy. So you can kind of overlay these two thoughts, you know, the higher up the mountain, you know, you are, chances are the more stuff you have mastered, right? Um, and then, you know, when you're at the top, you might say, well, you know, I can do this a little better and you're still chipping away at things and all that. And so that's kind of all within the world of mastery. But generally people at the top of the pile, we would consider them to be masters of, you know, our craft or our trade or whatever you want to call it. So here are some different contexts to consider. I think these contexts, these, they're not the only contexts, but I think they're the ones that sometimes, that they're the most often that get kind of forgotten about in our pedagogy. Now, um, there's three I listed. The first one is neuromuscular, having to do with facial stability and actually how the face muscles, et cetera, work to make, uh, you know, so we can make sound. There's also a harmonic context and a context of time. Now, today, this whole video is going to be on this neuromuscular context of facial stability. Um, some people call it embouchure. I don't like to call it embouchure uh, for various reasons, and I'll, you know, get into it here, or if I don't, you know, remind me in the comments. Um, but this video is going to be all about that. I'm eventually going to make a second video where I'll talk about harmonic context. Now, for those of you that were at the International Trombone Festival this year, I talked about neuromuscular and harmonic context, and that was the presentation. Um, I'm basically just splitting those up so I can really do a deep dive into the neuromuscular stuff here today. Uh, and the third concept, time, I have presented on that 2018 and 2019 at ITF. I've got a ton of YouTube videos out there. I'll eventually like make a third video, but for now, uh, we're just going to stick to the first one. So let's dive in, shall we? So neuromuscular, that is just a fancy word that describes the nervous system and the muscular system working together uh, to control movement, all right? So our muscles do things and the nervous system sends signals to the muscles, they do things, they learn things, and we get better at movement and all that. Um, specifically, I want to focus on facial stability. And that, what I mean by that is the way that the, the neuromuscular systems work to make this a very stable thing so we can essentially, you know, have some air run through uh, that and our instrument and make sound, all right? The way that our face makes sound. Now, here's some of my particular context when it comes to facial stability. So when I was about 16 years old, or 15 years old, I should say, I got into a really bad bicycle accident. I was going way too fast down a hill and I wasn't paying attention and I flipped over the handlebars into loose gravel and I had to go to the emergency room. I basically landed on my face and my shoulder. Um, and unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, I developed a fair amount of scarring. I have a, a scar up here on my face, and I also have scar tissue in my lip here and scar tissue in my lip here. I had a tooth that actually got knocked into its own row, and eventually I had to get that pulled. Um, but my face got pretty messed up. Now, you would think that this would be an issue for a trombone player, but as a 15-year-old in a small program in Connecticut, I had a fantastic band director. He was a you know, mentor of mine. But I, I was really motivated. I practiced all the time. I was making the All-State Band. I was one of the stronger kids in the band program. So there really wasn't a moment where anyone stood back and said, hmm, I think something's wrong with the way that he's playing. There's something about the way that this is working that it's not really getting the job done. Why? Because it was getting the job done for that level of play. So then I went to the University of Massachusetts uh, for my undergraduate study and David Sporney a uh, fantastic teacher, a mentor, a father figure to me, frankly. Um, he taught me so much about playing, but again, I was super motivated. I practiced all the time. I just worked really hard. Um, and whatever shortcomings kind of came up in my playing, they could either be compensated for, uh, you know, by the extra practice I did. I mean, there were days where I practiced like seven, eight hours, you know, at the undergraduate level. Um, I also switched to bass. So the fact that I had some range issues and the fact that I had some other things in my playing, it didn't stand out as much because I was experiencing success in the base, you know, at that level. And again, this concept of it wasn't a problem for that level of play. So it didn't stick out as the problem. Um, and I went on to grad school. I, you know, I eventually got a, a doctorate uh, from the Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University, a very prestigious university. And again, working really hard, checking all the boxes. I was playing in regional orchestras. I was a finalist for the brass concerto competitions. Like I was doing the things. And it wasn't yet a problem. And it wasn't until I was out in the real world, had a doctorate, had a full-time teaching position, I was playing in orchestras, and I, you know, I kept taking auditions, for example, 
at like regional orchestras and I wasn't advancing. And, and that, that voice in my head got louder and louder that was saying, you don't, you don't quite sound like everybody else in this room. There are things that people can do on this instrument that you really struggle with. And maybe I could play the list pretty well. And I thought I was prepared. But at the end of the day, when you think about those levels of the mountain, you know, people that are at a higher level on that mountain, just the way they do everything is just going to sound better. It's going to be hard to beat that, right? And so I, I, I realized that there's something wrong, something, something not functionally successful at higher levels in terms of how my face makes sound. Now, fortunately, all along this journey, I think I kind of knew that something was not quite right. And so I really got into kinesiology and exercise physiology neuromuscular control of movement, complex adaptive systems, cognitive ergonomics. I started studying all sorts of things. And I think I was just looking for answers. Well, about 30, about when I was about 38, about four or five years ago, um, I started kind of putting the puzzle pieces together. And I said, you know what, let's, let's not look at this pedagogically. Let's look at this from a, like a neuromuscular standpoint. And that kind of changed the game for me. So I want to talk about that today. So here are some facts about human movement, right? Life is motion. We use our muscles to move and everything that is alive is moving. That means that everything is, that is alive has some kind of, you know, muscular, you know, movement to it, right? Um, even our heart is a muscle that pumps blood. And so there's movement involved with that, right? Um, the, you know, we have neurochemicals that are changing and changing balances of this, and that, but there's muscular engagement as a byproduct of all that. And so that these ideas of living and moving and, and muscular use, it's all coupled together. Now, here are some myths. We train our muscles to move slash live. Well, that's kind of a myth. We can train our muscles to move and live, but as long as we're living, as long as we're moving, our muscles are gonna get trained as a byproduct of the movements, as a byproduct of the environmental constraints that we're kind of put on, you know, that we put on ourselves. We, you know, our muscles develop as a result, not, you know, not necessarily the other way around. Now, another myth is that we can completely relax our muscles. Uh, that's not actually true. Most of our muscles are innervated, to, even if it's just a couple of percent, you know, uh, innervation. But this this concept of total relaxation, like it's actually a misconception. And it's a phrase that you hear in pedagogy. You know, we oh, you got to stay totally relaxed while you play that. And well, that's not actually true um, to our bodies to maintain posture, to breathe, to hold our instruments. Um, there's muscular use there. I think that there is muscular engagement in our face uh, isometrically, you know, to maintain certain, you know, airflow and you know, therefore create certain sound in the instruments. But also, if there's something that you do and you don't do it in a way that you want to do and you're trying to like reestablish better habits, there's absolutely muscular engagement involved with that. And actually, at first, that manifests itself in, in quite crude results. And even Jake, Arnold Jacobs talked about how we have to become comfortable with the crudities in the sound until we can refine them out. Sometimes I think we get so wrapped up in trying to stay as relaxed as possible that we are not willing to kind of take the plunge into directions to engage the muscles and to make those changes. And so for some people that things are going well, that's great. But if you're teaching somebody in it, you know, and there are things they got to do, uh, you know, total relaxation might not be the thing you should focus on. Uh, it's not the hill I would want to die on. If you've ever read Zen and the Art of Archery, I think these concepts kind of get tied into that. You know, we don't shoot the arrow, it shoots. And it kind of removes that conscious control aspect of it. I think that's really important. So go read that book. Okay, here are some gray areas in terms of movement, right? All we have to do is think about the end goal and our bodies will figure it out. Oh, that sounds so dreamy. And for a lot of people, that's true most of the time. But there are absolutely times for some people, and I think for most people, there are at least some times where that's not true. So I would say that's sometimes true, right? Um, and, and unfortunately, what ends up happening is that we have this kind of pedagogical lineage of, well, my teacher said this and it worked, therefore it works. Therefore, I'm going to say that to my student. And if it doesn't work, there's something that the students just, maybe they're just not applying themselves well enough. They just need to practice more. And yeah, they might need to practice more, but I think that it's more nuanced than that. And there are times where thinking about the end goal is actually just going to have us kind of revert to certain habits that we've already established. And if those habits aren't the right habits, then we're just going to be getting really, really good at not getting the results we want, right? We get really consistent at that. So it's kind of this weird little paradox. Um, some people are more talented. I think that's a myth. 
but I can understand it's a gray area because I think there are physiological differences with people and therefore physiological advantages and disadvantages. I don't believe in talent. I don't believe people are gifted. I think uh, muscles can be trained. And that means that we can train them to be more coordinated. We train them to be stronger. Therefore, we can train our bodies to do things better. Uh, but some people do have some advantages um, that I, but I think we can kind of work around that. So that's where I'm coming from. So here's a little bit of history from the moment that we're born, we start to move and we start to engage our muscles. And as we move and we learn how certain things are good to do and certain things aren't good to do, and our muscles are getting trained, right? And they, res they, they, they kind of develop as a result of this movement. Well, how do our face muscles develop? Well, similar thing, right? When we start, we're, you know, crying and we're eating and we're yawning and we're chewing and we're laughing and we're growling and we're talking. And we're doing the things that like babies do, right? But then one day we slap a brass instrument on our faces and all of a sudden there's this new environmental constraint and then we want our muscles to respond and behave. And so they learn how to respond and behave in this new way. And so they start getting trained in a different way. Uh, you know, having brass player faces, like that's a thing, and woodwind players as well, like we are training our muscles differently. So here are just some of the basics of, I'm going to use the word embouchure, even though I'm not really a big fan of the word, but here are some basics, right? We essentially have these two teams of protagonist and antagonistic muscle groups, right? Um, in this context, I'm calling the antagonist group, but you can, those terms are kind of, you know, you can swap them around, it doesn't really matter. There's one group, which is essentially the orbicularis oris muscle, which is the kind of the ring Right here, it's underneath our lips, and it's it's kind of our mouth, lip muscle, whatever you want to call it. It's actually four muscles, and it was the early 2000s that physiologists finally made the call to say, okay, we're going to call that four muscles, not one muscle. That's kind of cool that things are still evolving in that world. But basically, that uh, the, the orbicularis oris kind of contracts and creates a smooching or a puckering. Sometimes we call it the kissing muscle. And then uh, the rest of our face is full of all these muscles that kind of pull out to the other, the other direction, right? And so these muscles, um, we have like the buccinator and, you know, zygomaticus major minor, and we've got like levator angle oris, and yeah, I think this one's like, uh, what is it, the aquiline nasi muscle, and then we've got depressor angular oris. We've got all these different muscles, and you don't really need to know the names of them, but the bottom line is there's all these muscles that essentially pull in the opposite direction from obicularis oris, right? So it creates this isometric contraction, this tug of war between the two. Remember, muscles only pull. So obicularis oris is going in, the kissing muscle, if you will. And then we use the slang term, the smiling muscles, but I think that actually is kind of a, it's a little ambiguous because it, it's really in all 360 degrees of direction, right? There's also a three-dimensionality to embouchure because our jaws are uh, highly mobile. That's how we talk, that's how we eat, right? Side to side front to back. So people that have overbites or underbites or whatever, um, our muscles can control kind of the placement of the jaw. That's going to affect the way that the whole system works. So we just need to keep in mind. Now, basics of neuromuscular control or exercise physiology, if you're learning about muscles, muscles need three things to do what we want them to do. And if we want them to be better at doing a thing, they need three things. They need strength, they need coordination, and they need endurance. Now, strength is just if they're strong enough to do whatever we're asking them to do, right? Coordination is that there are multiple muscles that work in concert. They work in conjunction with one another. And there's kind of like a recipe of how much of this muscle does it and how much of that muscle does the thing. And if there are, are certain coordination patterns that create certain results, we might call that our form or using the right form, right? And then endurance is just strength and coordination over time. At some point, if you run out of endurance, muscles start to get fatigued, they no longer can do the job, other muscles have to kind of then get involved, which changes the coordination patterns, and so it can kind of change everything we're doing. Now, if you're trying to get better, there's going to be a point where whatever the coordination, strength, endurance patterns of the muscles in your face, whatever those are, there's going to be a point to where they're going to reach kind of their limit, and you're not going to really be able to get much beyond that, right, in terms of your level of play. Now, if you aren't trying to develop your level of play, you may not even notice that you have these limitations, although everybody does, right? It's a moving target, but everybody's got a basic level of limitation with what, what their face is trained to do. So when we think back to that mountain base trombone or whatever mountain you happen to be trying to climb, if you're not trying to climb that high, there's a number of ways to do it. If, if the only thing you want to do is like, you know, play in your high school music ensemble, maybe be first chair, whatever. There's 10 different ways that your face can kind of coordinate and, you know, develop. And you'll be able to achieve that goal and just, you know, work hard and you'll get there and all that. But the higher up the mountain you want to go, the less 
options, the less diversity of how this works will get you there, right? And it gets much more and more specific. So you see over here, there's kind of all these different pathways. And if you're only trying to get to like base camp two, there's a number of paths to get there, right? But if you're trying to get to the top, it gets much more specific. And so usually what happens is when people graduate, go to grad school, or when they go from high school to undergraduate, or when they get out and they become pre-professional level, um, when we kind of have these new levels in our aspirations, and then we try to play at a higher level, all of a sudden we notice, hmm, there's something that's just not there. And we kind of reach these ceilings, right? These, these, these kind of limits. Um, and I think it's very much facial stability, which is why we're talking about it today. So every body is different, right? We all have individual differences and this ties into some physiological advantages. So here are some of the differences, origin and insertion of muscles. Every muscle has a basically a place that they're attached on both ends, one called the origin, one called the insertion. Now, um, apes, for example, are extremely strong compared to human beings, right? And so they can lift a lot. And if you think of the bicep muscle, if we want to bend our arm this way, the bicep muscle is actually attached down on the forearm and it acts as a pulley and pulls our arm this way, right? Well, for apes, where that bicep is attached, it's actually attached further up in the arm, which creates a much more, it creates a much more powerful lever. And so they're a lot stronger than we are, right? Well, there could be microscopic differences in facial construction with where the origin and insertion of various muscles are placed, which will make some of those muscles a little stronger or a little weaker, which will change certain coordinative patterns that naturally develop through movement or through playing, which will change the way somebody sounds, which will change the way somebody develops when they play certain things that impose certain constraints or challenges on the system. And so we can all develop differently. And sometimes that gets misconstrued as talent. It's not talent. It's slight physiological differences. And that can be trained if you know what you're doing, right? Um, when we're talking about flexibility and agility, if you're even if you're playing a whole note here and a whole note here, to play a whole note and then change, let's say, go up an octave to the next whole note, that's an instantaneous change or as, much, as close to instantaneous as we can make it. That's fast twitch muscle fibers, even though it's a slow note. So I would argue that, you know, people that have insane like trill chops and flexibility and agility, and we all know players like that. I bet you if we ran some studies, we'd find that they, maybe they just have more fast twitch muscle fibers. And so that became something that was, you know, not easy for them, but it just came you know, much more naturally and much more quickly for them. And then maybe they leaned into it because, you know, we tend to lean into the things we're good at. And next thing you know, there's an individual difference, right? We have individual differences in our history of movement. We speak different native languages, the vowel and consonant sounds and the way that our tongue's coordinated. Um, so certain native languages probably have certain things that happen a little bit more easily, a little bit more difficult. Um, and you can hear that in articulation or vowel sounds or what have you. Um, practice habits, obviously that's going to affect the way that this all develops. And if you're dealing with acute injury, you know, that might affect the way that your system develops. And I think that's what happened with me. I think my system developed in a different way. It kind of like shifted trajectories because of the acute injury that I had when I was younger. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, this is where I think, you know, pedagogy can take it a step further than it typically does. Let's say you are dealing with some kind of intonation limitation, inefficient buzzing, range or flexibility limitations or articulation limits, something about these aspects of playing where like you're trying to get better and it seems like you can't get better. Well, most teachers will say, you know, there's an airflow issue or there's tension in the body and that's actually the biggest root of cause, right? And, you know, you've got to get the airflow. And yeah, of course, we need air flowing in the system to have a beautiful sound that's supported. And if we have too much tension in the body, that's going to restrict the airflow. Yeah, so of course, I'm not disagreeing with that. But here's where I think we could take it a step further. What is causing the tension in the body? It's not as common that I hear people say, hmm, that person's getting tense when they play. I wonder why. Where is the tension coming from? My argument is the tension is most likely coming from a lack of or a limitation of facial stability. The muscles in the face are limited in terms of the strength, the coordination, or the endurance. And therefore, the next body, the, the next natural response from the body is to engage other muscles to try to get the job done. We see this all the time, and this can happen at any level along the way, right? So tension is a progressive thing. Whether you're playing a video game and you're trying to get the controller to move and you start getting tense, or you're, you know, you're lifting huge weights, or you're trying to play high notes on a trumpet and you haven't really developed your face muscles to do that efficiently, when you are struggling to get something done that you want to get done, the body's natural response is to try harder, right? And this causes more tension, right? This is the force, not the finesse. And when we start forcing it, I think that the biggest reason why brass players play with tension is because at some point, they're basically asking their face to do something that their face can't yet do. It's not trained up enough to be able to do that, whether it's strength, coordination, or endurance. 
And remember, it's like this tug of war, right? If any one part of the system starts giving way, right? So like the buccinator muscle on the side, if, if you have weak buccinator muscles, and really, how would you know? You know, like nobody knows that, right? But let's say you have weak buccinator muscles. Well, now all of a sudden, the other muscles kind of need to pick up slack or other muscles have to do more work and then they get fatigued more and it kind of creates this chain reaction of events kind of all over the face. And next thing you know, the coordination patterns have changed and therefore the shape of the mouth has changed. Now you can't articulate as well. Your flexibility isn't as good. Um, your sound quality changes when you try to get into extreme dynamics or extreme registers, everything changes, right? And I think it just comes back down to the strength coordination and endurance of the muscles in our face. So to that end, uh, fortunately, you know, I studied this kind of stuff. And so I developed uh, the Solomon stability training method. I basically came up with a method uh, that can help anybody and it works for everybody. So it focuses on isometric contraction, basically through long tones, uh, free buzzing, mouthpiece playing, rim playing, that kind of stuff. Um, and it meets players at their current level of, uh, you know, strength, coordination and endurance and it creates a slow and specific development. We have to move incrementally, right? Um, I Once upon a time, I posted a video about forming a new habit where I used a PVC pipe. And I you know, cut a little groove in the PVC pipe and I talked about how if, you know, contextual interference, if what you wanna do is actually very similar to what you already have trained and habited, you have to be super specific if you wanna to try to create a new habit that has to only be slightly different than that previous habit. And so we have to, there are some profound implications to how we should be training, right? But it has to be very specific and measured and all that stuff. Now, when you go to the gym, many of you have probably been to the gym, you've seen the plates, you know, there's 45 pounds and 35s and 25s and 10s and fives and two and a halfs, and it basically creates a very small difference. But most of the research is done on large muscle groups and athletics. And for the big muscles and the big muscle groups and all that, you need to stay within 5% of whatever weight you're working with. Uh, if you go more than that, you really run the risk of actually ch using a different coordination pattern and therefore a different movement, right? It's entirely a, kind of a different movement. So the plates go down to like two and a half plates. There is not really any research that I'm aware of that has studied like even, you know, small muscles, we're talking about tiny, tiny muscles, right? And so when we want to talk about training the level of strength, the level of coordination and the level of endurance of these tiny muscles, I think we have to get within 1%, even a fraction of a percent in terms of the difference of what we do now in terms of resistance versus what we're trying to do. And therefore, I think our methods are way too vague for many people. Now, if our, like if playing Remington long tones or Caruso or whatever works for you, great, good for you. I think that's awesome. If it doesn't, I think the reason is because the it's just too vague in terms of the slight differences that need to be created with the resistance, right? So I'm going to show you what I did, okay? So practice log, I, I decided I was going to practice every day. I'm on this thousand day practice journey. So here's day 467, and here's a stability exercise that I did on that day. Now you'll notice uh, on this chart, um, higher notes are to the right, lower notes are to the left. And then um, there's a greater ratio of playing as you kind of go up the chart vertically. So if you play for four beats and rest for four beats and just repeat that pattern over and over, you're playing 50% of the time. But if you play for six beats and rest for two beats using the same tempo, so you have a metronome going to 120 and you play for six beats and you rest for two beats, you're now playing 75% of the time. So that's a higher ratio. So it's higher up in the chart. And each one of these green you know, squares represents a two minute workout on a different note on my instrument. And not surprisingly, as I get higher in the range, there's a, a decrease in the ratio that I can successfully do that at before my face gets too fatigued or the, you know, the coordination patterns change and I hear everything change and all that. Another thing I noticed is that, and with all my clients and with my students and myself and everybody, everybody has a drop off. It's not a linear, it's not a slow decline. It's like, okay, it gets harder, it gets harder. And then whoa, we all fall off the deep end. So there's a point where everybody drops off a cliff and I, I have yet to find people who don't, right? That's just the way it is. And that's fine. And that makes total sense given the way that we play, right? And things that we know trends in our playing, right? So <clears throat> here's day 468. Now I'm not going to show the first 466 days or whatever, because frankly, there was a lot of research and development. It reminds me of those people that were trying to figure out how to build airplanes and they just crashed for a very long time, just over and over. Um, what I was doing before this point was yes, long tones and I was trying different things. But it took me a little bit to really come up with what I think is the way, right? The, the most effective, the most efficient way to do it. So here we go, day 468, I did some of these notes. And then on day 469, you can see that some of the notes start moving slightly up. So I basically take these notes and I don't do every note every day. I kind of alternate through the notes. 
but as the days progressed, I started doing slightly more ratio of time playing versus time resting. So maybe I'm doing eight beats on, two beats off. You know, maybe I'm doing nine beats on, two beats off. Maybe I'm doing nine beats on, one beat off. And I'm just kind of slowly increasing the ratios. And sure enough, every day it's getting a little bit stronger, a little bit better coordinated. I'm gaining a little bit of endurance. Now, when I got to about day 600, I decided that just in case I don't want to develop kind of the wrong coordination pattern, let's drop back down to where I really think it's the sound that I want to have. And then let's re-coordinate and kind of rebuild up from there. Right. So here we go. I did that. I dropped everything down in terms of the ratios and I just took it like one click at a time. Right. Just a little bit more ratio. I did like four different notes every day or five different notes every day. And sure enough, I just got these slow, steady climbs. Now, this slight incremental improvement, I was able to retrain my muscles to work in a new way. And next thing you know, I'm just making good gains. And it's awesome, right? Every day I'm just getting a little bit better. So I don't do the same workout every day. It's actually every day, it's usually slightly a little more ambitious in terms of what I'm asking in terms of strength, coordination, endurance, right? So right around the time that I got to day 800, I said, hmm, you know, I'm doing two minutes on the horn and I'm doing two minutes on my rim. But I wonder what would happen if I started doing one minute versions or four minute versions. I bet you I would see a different pattern of decline. It'd be a different slope, right? And so sure enough, I started experimenting with that. And next thing you know, um, there are all sorts of different slopes. Now, this is interesting. If you look at the green squares in the middle, uh, day 872, you'll notice the green squares. I was kind of topping out at the top of my chart. I, I have since extended the chart out, but back then I was kind of reaching the ceiling. And then there's that big drop off kind of right in the middle of the chart. And then it kind of levels off from there. And then there's another, you can kind of see these stepwise motions. But you'll notice that the green squares, it's different than the blue squares. Those are two different workouts, two different lengths of time. And sure enough, there's a different trend of fatigue that happens uh, or a different trend of strength that happens uh, as I kind of progress up the range of my instrument. And I think that that's fascinating, right? So I wanted to kind of lean into that and work on that. So sure enough, more progression, keep going. And I had set out to do a thousand days of practice in a row. Oh, and at this point, by the way, I'm still practicing every day, but you'll notice the numbers are going every other day because at this point, it's a really, it's a very fatiguing workout. So it's kind of like going to the gym. Uh, so at this point, I'm doing it every other day. So I play every day, but I don't do stability every day because it's too hard at this point. Uh, I think you need to recuperate, you know, let the muscles kind of rest and recuperate. Fortunately, I didn't stop at day 1000 because here I feel like I'm just starting to figure out what my face needs to do. Now, had I known how to do it from the beginning, it wouldn't have taken me that long. Uh, but, you know, I was kind of learning how to fly the plane as I was writing the manual. Um, I, the blue squares here, I added in. Oh, I lost my screen. There we go. I added in a uh, blue squares, uh, which was free buzzing, right? And so I started doing a lot of free buzzing on my instrument. And you can see that those kind of slowly gained incrementally. And I just kept adding and adding and adding. And for the red, that's four minutes of free buzzing. So I'm doing like four minutes of free buzzing, four minutes of rim buzzing, four minutes on the horn going up and up and up. Now here's a real interesting spot. So you'll notice over here in the upper left, these are the lower notes in my range. And you'll notice that there's some gray bars. The gray bars indicate when um, I ran out of air before I ran out of face. Like if I had to play 30 beats on one beat off and I had to play a note and sustain it for 15 seconds, right? Um, I was not able to do that. My face wasn't tired, but I just didn't have enough breath. So I would play softer and play softer and play softer. Um, and over time, you'll notice that the gray bars kind of start disappearing because I get better and better at playing those notes down in that part of the range. I wasn't doing a lot of breathing, Jim. What I was doing was gaining efficiency of vibration right here. And so I was actually gaining an ability to... Um, Well, burn less, burn less fuel. I guess that's the best way to say it. I had a motor that was running cleaner. It was burning less fuel. So my breath was traveling, you know, farther, further, right? Um, so I was taking the same breath in, but I was able to sustain phrases a little bit further and further and further. And so I actually feel that at this point, um, I have had way more gains on my breath efficiency and my breath control and making phrases by working the exhale, by getting the buzz to be efficient, doing a lot of free buzzing, doing stability training, 
than I have by doing breathing exercises and all that stuff. We spend a lot of time doing breathing exercises. I don't think we spend enough time focusing on the efficiency of vibration. I think stability training is where it's at because you'll, I mean, the gains down there were profound. So we keep going here. There's still the big drop off over to the side, but here we are. I'm on 1300 and every day the numbers are getting higher and higher. The ratios are getting higher and higher. There doesn't seem to be a limit or, you know, I'm not, not really plateauing in that way. So day 1450, that was like yesterday. So that's where it's at. I'm not done. I'm going to continue going on this journey. Uh, but this is about what the pattern looks like. And you can see there's kind of a mid range where everything's, you know, reasonably consistent. And then there's a, a drop off at, on the right and that's the high notes. And then there's a drop off on the left and that's usually breath, you know, limitations down there. Right. So here's an interesting thing. I also came up with an articulation exercise. So for articulation, high notes to the right, and also the tempo is what increases. So let's say I'm playing two beats on, two beats off. Da 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 And I'm doing a certain note within the range. Or let's say I'm doing three beats on, one beat off. Da 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 Or I'm doing double tonguing. There's going to be different tempos for every note. It's the same chart. Notice how the notes at the right, higher part of my range, I have less ability to tongue cleanly, right? It doesn't matter if it's single, double, triple tonguing, it just falls off a cliff. On the left, there's also some breath challenges and coordinating the tongue in that way. And the points of drop off are the same. They're the same exact points of drop off from my facial stability as they are in my articulation. And this is another thing that I've kind of just, it came to me. It is profound, but my articulation is actually a function of my stability. The more that I train this aspect of my face to work well, the more I'm able to articulate. Now, you need to have air support and you need to have the air, you know, the tongue rides the air and all that stuff, of course. But our tongues are actually highly dexterous and trained due to language acquisition. I think the big uh, limiting factor for most people is actually facial stability. So if you want to get better at tonguing, you probably need to visit your facial stability. At least that's what I have found, not only for myself, but several of my students. So now let's compare articulation to stability. Sure. Boom. There it is. Let's look at those charts. Roughly the same day and roughly the same drop off. Um, the point in my range at this note, stability starts going down. And at this note, articulation starts going down. And to be honest, uh, now seeing it on the graph, when I re recollect how I play, I can say, yeah, okay, at that point in my range, there's some weirdness that starts to happen. So now I can actually start coming up with like little exercises and phrases and patterns, and maybe I can focus on certain repertoire, certain, you know, etudes and stuff that kind of cross over that line to really make sure I'm working and buffing that out. So having the data has really been hugely impactful. So I think anybody that's dealing with range issues and the extremes, of, especially in the extremes, if you're dealing with just getting anything consistent, right? Like you just can't get a consistent enough tone, consistent enough articulation, consistent enough intonation. If you're dealing with flexibility limitations, uh, you don't feel like your flexibility is, you know, as, as, as light, as quick, as efficient as it could be. Articulation issues, breath control issues, even sight reading issues. I think these are all byproducts of stability. And I think that the biggest, you know, rock in the bucket that you probably need to check out is actually stability training. Now, this data has also uh, been helping my students. So here are four students in my studio. You know, I teach at a small school in Alabama. We don't have a performance major. We are all, you know, music ed or music industry or general music. But here's four undergraduate students, day 60. And let's watch the progression up through, uh, you know, about 40 days worth. So you'll notice that every day they get a little bit, the numbers get a little bit higher in terms of ratios or they go a little bit to the right. They're gaining range in the upper, you know, upper range. Um, and every day, basically, I would send them a little workout and then they would let me know how it goes. And they write back, you know, oh, that note was easy, plus five. Oh, that note was really hard, minus four, you know, whatever. And then I write new workouts based on that information. I crunch the numbers and I figure out where the chart needs to go from there. And everybody's just kind of developing. So on the one hand, I am creating an individualized, you know, curriculum in terms of facial training and stability training for each student. I meet them at their level. They're improving and that's all great. But you'll also notice that there are individual differences. Like if you look at the upper left, I mean, this person's got a lot of facial stability. Like those ratios are really high. The chart goes up to 80 beats on, one beat off up there. I mean, that's a lot of time, right? And then if you look at the chart below that, they don't have as much facial stability. Their face gets, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not as stable right now. So you're going to hear it in the articulation. You're going to hear it in the range. You're going to hear it in the flexibility. You're going to hear it in a lot of things. Maybe they don't have as much control in the soft dynamics, right? 
But he, here's another great thing about this from a pedagogical consideration. So every semester, these students audition for large ensembles. And every semester there are results that get posted and every semester there's some kids that are happy and some kids that aren't happy. Some get a little salty that they didn't get the spot they wanted or, you know, whatever. And sometimes, you know, we, when we're students, we can kind of get wrapped up and, you know, we think it's politics or we think there are, there's bias involved or, you know, we hear other players, you know, in the studio and practice room and maybe we think, I don't know, they don't sound that good. Right? So, you know, we can kind of get that little chatter in our minds. I think data can help kind of alleviate those biases that we all have, right? Um, there is something really powerful about saying, look, here are the charts of the people that made the top ensemble. And then here are the charts of the people that made the second ensemble. Here are the charts of the people that made the third ensemble. Do you notice anything? And if we as a studio can start seeing trends and correlations, oh, look, at yeah, okay, those people seem to have more stability. I mean, if the repertoire that you have to play for the audition requires a fair amount of range and endurance, which one of these four players do you think has, is going to have the most control? Now, they may not be the most prepared at the repertoire, but in terms of just control, which is a big piece of the puzzle, they have an advantage, right? The upper left player has an advantage when it comes to repertoire that requires that, right? So putting it just very plainly in data for students to see, I think that's helpful for them, right? And it takes the biases away. It takes all that chatter away. And it comes just back to this, right? You train your stability and, and you'll get there, right? We just need to train it, right? Now let's compare these to my charts because here's another profound thing, right? So here's me on day 400. Here's my students on day 100. Notice they all have more stability than I do. Like if we were to evaluate where their numbers are versus where my numbers are, they have way more stability than I do. Here's me on day 500, day 600, day 700. They still have more stability. They hate them. They still have more stability. So here about day 900, I think we're starting to kind of get into that realm where some of my students have about that much or, you know, maybe a little more. But so it took me, my face was so messed up. It took me like almost three years to get to a point to where my stability level was at about an undergraduate level, right? But now watch what happens. Here's the difference. I do it. I practice every day. And so day 1100, day 1200, day 1300, day 1400, right? I just got better. I just kept training it. And so I think one of the things that's really helpful when students see this is they say, oh, yeah, if I just do this, I mean, if a student comes in and, and, you know, any one of these students that you see, if they commit to doing stability every day, and then when they get to a point where the exercise is, you know, too uh, challenging, and then they do it every other day, right? But they do it consistently for 12 to 18 months, they're going to have as much stability as I have on day 1400. I have a doctorate. I play in professional orchestras. I, I'm a college professor. Like, I'm, I'm doing the things. Like, I do the things. And it would take them like 18 months. Imagine if a freshman comes in, commits to stability training, and does it for four years. Like that's how you get into Juilliard. And it just so happens that a lot of those kids, when they were 15 years old, playing their Roshu and playing their Remington and playing their Schlossberg and playing their Arben, they happen for whatever reason, whether it was physiological advantage or they just happen to play in a certain way, or they had a good teacher who just, you know, was listening for the right things and kind of put them on the right track whether it was overt or not, they happen to develop stability. And so by the time they graduated high school, they had professional level stability. And so they were able to get into those more competitive programs, right? Um, but it's not mystery and it's not talent. It's not even rocket science. It's just, if you train stability, you'll be more stable. And that's gonna have a profound implication across many aspects of your playing. Now you can also look at stability training uh, for um, a rehab. Right? So here's a good friend of mine. His name is Dr. Brian Appleby Weinberg, he, a professor of trumpet at Rowan University. Uh, he works with the Atlantic Grass Band, great trumpet player, not so great at riding a bicycle. He got into a really bad bicycle accident. I tried to warn him that bicycles are bad, but he didn't listen. He got in this bad accident. So he let it, you know, he talked to me and he's a good friend of mine. And so we're like, all right, six weeks, whatever, heal, don't worry about it. And then we'll start training. And sure enough, we just started picking notes. And we picked ratios and he would let me know how it goes. And if it's too easy, I move it up. And if it's too hard, I either move it down or let it stay there. And then we just keep ratcheting it up ever so slightly every single day, right? And he's just going through and it's getting stronger and stronger. We added some flea buzzing, you know, and he's going through. And yeah, there's a drop off, right? There, there's the drop off. It's there. But the numbers are just slowly improving. They just keep getting better and better. And so now we're at a point where actually he's alternating every other day, but some days are pick and some days are cornet and some days are trumpet. And so here's, uh, I think this is the most recent one. 
I think this is really interesting because you'll notice there's a drop off in the playing. So the playing is the, the higher three curves, the green one and the orange one and the grayish one, right? And then the other one, the purple one, the blue one, red, that's free buzzing, right? So both of them have a drop off. They kind of have parallel slopes. They just drop off a cliff at some point. But you'll also notice that the point where he runs out of free buzzing ability, that's about the point where we start to see the drop off in the actual playing. And that kind of makes sense because the way that the muscles are coordinated to do the thing, um, if you get to a point where you can't like make a buzz like at that point, the way you're going to essentially go th like send that through an instrument is going to change. And if you don't, you know, like it makes sense, it's going to fall off a cliff at that point. So we see that a lot. And we actually see that in woodwinds as well. Uh, oboist, clarinetist, I, they're, they're my clients of mine and the oboist. Yeah, their chart looks similar. It starts to drop off at the end. And then the clarinetist, now the clarinetist, uh, clarinet such a low flow rate instrument. Uh, that we had to do it differently. So they do like a five minute exercise and then they do some free buzzing and they do something on their barrel. That's like the little blue thing in the middle, but you'll notice there's kind of a gradation of shading of colors. That's because some days they use hard reads, some days they use medium reads, some days they use uh, soft reads. And so that, that kind of changes things. But here, notice this, certain notes on the instrument, you could argue that it has a different level of resistance. And so therefore, you know, they're not gonna be able to do it as well. But notice that that one note that seems to be a really resistant instrument and they can't do it at the same ratio, that's right about the same point that their free buzzing starts to kind of fall off the cliff and they run out of free buzzing ability. Let's find out what happens over the next six months, because if they gain a little bit more free buzzing strength and coordination and can free buzz higher into their range, I wonder if that note on the clarinet is going to be able to be kind of smoothed out in terms of how stable they can play it. Can't wait to find out. So the Neil Humfeld Award winner this year for the International Trauma Association was David Sporny, my mentor. At his uh, acceptance speech at the conference, he said, remember your long tones. I could not agree more. I think long tones are the answer to stability. I think we just need to get far more specific about how long we play and how long we rest and how we cycle through all of that. If we really want to make sure we're fatiguing our muscles in a healthy way so that they get stronger, they get better coordinated, they gain endurance. It doesn't matter where you are on the journey. If you're, if you're, try, if you're, reaching, if you're somewhere and you're having trouble getting to the next level, my bet is that you need to shine a flashlight on your facial stability, strength, coordination, or endurance, or a combination thereof. So if you want more information, if you have a student that you think that can benefit from this, if you could benefit from this, if you just want to pass along because you think it's cool stuff, if you go to my website, jasonsolomon.com, stability training. Uh, you can get more info there. I kind of talk through it there, but I just wanted to share that all with you. I want to give a special thanks and shout out to M&W Custom Trombones. Um, I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed playing their instruments, um, and as an M&W artist, I feel like they have really given me uh, just a, a voice, and I, I just I have found my home in their sound, and it's been wonderful to work with them. So thanks for making such great instruments. And there are many great instrument makers out there, so you know I'm sure many of you are playing all sorts of different equipment, but I just there's a special place in my heart for what they're doing over at M&W. So if you haven't checked those out at a conference or whatever, look into it. It's fantastic craftsmanship. If you have any questions about any of the stuff I talked about today, um, you can find me on Instagram. I've got a website. I've got a YouTube channel. I post a ton of stuff there. This video is going right up on the YouTube channel. Please share it. Watch it in your studio classes. Pass around. It's going to be about 50 minutes long. Um, get the word out because I think that there are a lot of people out there who didn't struggle with stability. And so they may not know how to teach it with some with a student that they have who is struggling with stability. And they may not even recognize that that's what's going on. Um, it, it doesn't mean that they're a bad teacher. It doesn't mean that they're a bad student. It just means that it's something very specific and it's a very specific thing. And if we can get after that specific thing, then we can really make some profound breakthroughs in playing. And I think we can change the face of pedagogy, no pun intended. Thanks so much for watching everybody. Happy practicing. Let's get better together.